Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for PLA, an update on relevant criteria and assumed practices. We want to give special thanks to our funders, Lumina Foundation and Strata Education Network. I'm Sarah Appel, and I am the Multi-State Collaborative on Military Credit Project Manager, and this is an initiative of the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. Just a couple of things uh, for questions. Please submit them through the chat feature, and we will do follow-up as we go through the slides. A general overview of the MCMC uh, is basically to facilitate an interstate partnership of 13 states and to translate competencies acquired by veterans through military training and experiences toward college credentials. States exchange information and they share best practices in the areas of articulation of credit, certification and licensure, communication, and data and technology. Our project goals are to assist states and post-secondary institutions in aiding military-connected students with critical life transitions from the military to the post-secondary education and then from post-secondary education into civilian employment. Increase post-secondary education completion rates by creating models for the consistent, transparent, and effective awarding of credit for military training and experience that can be scaled regionally and nationally, thereby lowering the cost of education and reducing the time to completion. Establish a strong network of support, communication, documentation, and data collection among institutions and organizations for the purpose of promoting shared interests and tracking the efficacy of efforts to enhance military-connected students' educational success. We have four knowledge communities in MCMC, the articulation of academic credit, communication and outreach, data systems and technology, and again, licensure and certification. I'm very happy to introduce our presenter. Uh, today we have Karen Solomon, who is the Vice President for Accreditation Relations from the Higher Learning Commission. Uh, thank you, Karen, for joining us, and I will turn the presentation over to you. Great. Thank you, Sarah. I'm pleased to be here this afternoon, and uh, we'll talk through the Commission's expectations, but also provide plenty of time for question and answers from the group. So, Sarah, as questions come in, if you'd, um, if, if they're right where we're talking about at that point in time, um, feel free to interrupt me, and we'll answer questions as we go through the presentation instead of waiting all the way to the end, um, knowing that sometimes those questions at the end just don't make as much sense as, as if they were asked right about the time when we were discussing some key topics. So I'm going to move ahead here. So let's just first begin with the expectation of assuring quality uh, through accreditation. Uh, and that responsibility re re lies with the institution itself. Um, institutions are evaluated by a group of volunteers. They're peer reviewers that have been selected for their experience, um, both professional experience and their academic backgrounds. Um, but they are not expected to go out and try to figure out what the institution does. The institution actually provides evidence um, demonstrating its capacity to meet the criteria for accreditation or other expectations for accreditation. Um, and that's an important element here of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to, we're going to towards the end, talk about a little bit about specific points of um, evidence as we go forward. Um, be before we get started here, I don't know if folks were aware, but as the Commission actually has been granting, um, allowing military credit to be applied towards degrees since January of 1942. And that always seems to surprise folks. The first policy back during the wartime was allowed that um, College credit could be granted for um, soldiers that actually completed basic training, um, and then the suggestion was at that point in time that those credits could be applied towards something such as physical education, hygiene, or some of the electives. Um, there was a very low amount of credit that could be granted for that, but there was recognition um, that that should be applied towards higher education. A few months later, then in November of 1942, um, the association developed a statement that it sent to institutions that favored granting credit for competence actually demonstrated through performance in specially prepared examinations instead of just blanket credit for war service. 
Um, and this was the first time that it really allowed students the opportunity to accelerate their time to completion um, on the basis of taking examinations and showing, demonstrating levels of achievement. Um, that's pretty significant. That's, so we've been in the um, supporting military education in a variety of different ways, even back since the 1940s. And I would have to say that we as a commission have not changed much over the years. I think much of the conversation that I am involved with on a regular basis actually comes from institutions that are unsure of how to grant credit um, and what it should be applied to and things like that. Let's talk a bit about how we evaluate an institution um, and how an institution prepares for that evaluation. Um, from the elements of accreditation, the key attribute here is the criteria for accreditation. They're central to demonstrating quality at an institution. Um, and they're evaluated as part of a standardized monitoring that we may have or a comprehensive evaluation that occurs uh, prior to the reaffirmation of continuing an institution as an accredited institution. Um, that criteria for accreditation has several different elements that we're going to talk about um, where you could provide evidence of what you're doing in, in relationship to military credit um, that's being applied towards higher education credentials. And then assumed practices are elements that we expect or assume that institutions will always have in place. Um, and they are typically in, uh, evaluated as an institution coming through our candidacy process to become an accredited institution. Sometimes if an institution is on a sanction, we may ask for specific elements of assumed practices. But these assumed practices should be something that are just a common way that an institution functions. And I have many institutions that actually use the assumed practices to sort of test against their assumed practices when they're going through significant changes at their institution to make sure that they're still in compliance with those assumed practices. And some of our institutions that are in the midst of a lot of change and um, rebuilding at this point in time um, in their history actually will state, wait, stop, we need to take a look at those assumed practices and are we still in alignment with what is expected of the institutions of higher education. We don't typically evaluate those specific assumed practices unless there's a call out and a reason that we need to do that. So it's not part of a regular comprehensive evaluation or things like that. They sort of they're sort of hovering there in the background, I think, would be the best way to, to describe that. We mentioned the criteria. Um, each criterion has a couple different elements to it, and this is where we start to go down uh, and break that down. There are five criterion, and they are broad statements. Um, institutions must explicitly address those. And then, then under each of the criterion, we have what are called core components. And they actually are specific areas of focus. They fine tune a little bit more what those expectations are for that criterion. Um, and then below that, there are elements called subcomponents. We do not specifically individually evaluate each subcomponent, but they should be addressed if they're applicable to your institution. So we evaluate the core components first. There are 21 core components across those five criteria. So our peer reviewers, when they're evaluating an institution, looks at each of those 21 core components and makes 21 individual decisions on whether that core component is met and meets our expectations. Um, and then those core components roll up to the criteria for accreditation. So if you're new to accreditation, it's important for you to understand that your emphasis really should be at that core component level because that's where the baseline of evaluation occurs. Um, and that's where you'll be rolling in most of your evidence as you prepare for an examination. Now, we um, interestingly enough are going through a revision of our criteria for accreditation. My presentation this afternoon, I'm actually going to give you what's currently in place and then also what the, the projected changes are. So I have some links here and this slide presentation will be available um, after we've completed this session today. Um, and I actually put the actual links to the pages of our website so it would be easier for you to find. Um, one is the general website uh, where you can find any and all information including the assumed practices, um, substantive change requests, all of those types of things. Um, the next two links here, one is for the current set of criteria and then the other is for the proposed set of criteria. Uh, and the note will indicate here 
that we have gone through a revision of our criteria. They were last put into effect in um, 2013, and by policy, we're required to review our criteria every five years. And we went through that type of a change uh, evaluation and identified where we had some redundancies, both from what our institutions had been telling us and what our peer reviewers had been telling us, also what we were seeing as staff that worked directly with team reports and things like that, where we were seeing some repetitiveness. So we, we eliminated some of that. Uh, we also reorganized um, a few elements. There are no significant changes in the way that there were when we, when we adopted the criteria that went in effect in 2013. That was a real overhaul. Um, this was really more of a cleanup exercise. Um, we are a membership organization, and so the membership actually adopts the criteria for accreditation. Uh, staff make recommendations to our Board of Trustees. Um, we made the recommendation to the Board of Trustees on, on an alpha version of the criteria. Then that was posted for our membership to comment on, um, and there were some strong comments on some issues, so we went back to the drawing board, made some um, modifications, took the beta version back to our Board of Trustees, um, and they have approved that for first reading, and so now we're once again in another comment period. Um, and that's winding down here, and our, we're anticipating that our Board of Trustees will vote next month in February to adopt that beta version. Um, both of the, uh, the proposed revised criteria beta versions on our website, so you can see the full, the full piece there. And you'll see where we've moved some elements from one area to another criterion and things like that. Um, what you'll also see then is that um, in that proposed beta version, you'll see a timeline of events. And our expectation is that the board adopts these uh, revised criteria this February uh, we need some time to make some technological changes. We also need to give our institutions time to build their cases um, with the, in that revised criteria in place. And so our expectation is the effective date will be, should be, September of 2020. Um, so that gives our institutions about a month, a year and a half, excuse me, to prepare for reviews, especially if they have a review coming up in fall 2020. But like I said, most of our institutions are already working on these elements. They just may be reorganized um, into different sections, and so they may need to move parts away. So if you were around at the time of the last revision of the criteria and you weren't aware of this taking place, um, you'll find that there are very few changes that are going to be dramatic that you will really need to put some additional effort into. Uh, for the, those of you that may or may not be familiar with the criteria, I thought it would be helpful just to walk through the the high-level criteria, and then also touch on a few core components um, that may really impact here um, in regards to your efforts in evaluating and awarding credit for military experience. Criterion one, there's like remind you, excuse me, there are five criterion. Criterion one is about mission and expects the institution's mission to be clear and articulated publicly, and there should be evidence that it really guides the institution operations, whether that is um, in planning processes or curricular programs that are offered or student populations served, things like that. Some institutions have very restrictive missions. Others are more general in purpose. And when we talk about mission here, it's, and the institution's mission, it's not necessarily just that pithy one or two sentence um, mission that we're, we're looking at. We're looking at the mission documents and the the values documents and things like that that an institution has that supports, um, upholds the mission of the institution. And those really become the guiding factors of how the institution makes um, long-term decisions and builds its governance processes and, and all of those types of things. Criteria number two then calls for the institution to operate in, in ethical and responsible ways at all levels of the institution, faculty, staff, students, board members, and things like that. Um, and in this situation, quite often, you have to prove the negative. This is a difficult one to say. We operate with integrity. Um, so often you're demonstrating that this is how we make sure that we are operating with integrity. Or here are some issues when um, we've been in some situations where there were ethical lapses, and here's what we've done to rectify that. And so, Criterion 2 calls for a different way of analysis um, and evidence building by the institution. 
but this is a, a, a point here where our institutions really have the opportunity to look across the institution and say, are we, are we firing on all cylinders across all different populations of our institution, not just focusing on the board of trustees um, or the faculty, but really looking all the way across um, the institution. Within this, oops, there we go. Within this core component, there's one core component here, core component 2B, um, and we're making some modifications in this revised criterion version. And so where you see this, uh, this lined out area, that was in the current criteria for accreditation, where actually the proposal is to eliminate that. Um, we felt that, that the language in there was too limiting, um, and institutions wanted to actually provide more information. Um, and we want to encourage that. So the revised proposed core component here would be the institution presents itself clearly and publicly to its students, excuse me, clearly and completely to its students and to the public. Now institutions don't have to step away from what's been here before. Uh, we just not are articulating so specifically the expectations. Many of the expectations that are written here are actually called out in federal uh, regulations as it relates to Title IV financial aid. Um, and you'll see some of that as you work uh, on a comprehensive evaluation, completing all the expectations for federal compliance filing that we do um, as a review for, as a, as a gatekeeper for the U.S. Department of Education. So as you see here, we're not adding a lot of new language or more expectations, but actually opening up that door a bit for institutions to make those determinations along with reviewing what's, response, what's required for the Title IV um, expectations. So Criterion 1 and 2 about mission and integrity, those could apply to any type of organization or entity. Uh, criterion 3 and 4 are really where we start to really focus in on institutions of higher education. Criterion 3 calls for um, teaching learning, uh, but this is really focused on the front end. How is the institution set up and prepared to serve students. And so this really looks at quality resources and support. And you'll see here we've, we've modified the expectation here. Uh, we remove the term high quality um, and provide quality because high was always one of those where our peer reviewers and our institutions were kept asking, what's high enough? Um, or where is that bar? And we never set that bar. Uh, we accredit more than 980 institutions and we cover uh, 19 states, and our range of institutions is from uh, two-year community colleges to major research universities to tribal colleges to liberal arts institutions, uh, religious faith-based institutions, single-purpose institutions such as a, um, an art school or things like that. And so that high quality expectation uh, was difficult to define um, in one umbrella that would cover all of our institutions. Um, so we made some, some modifications as far as that goes, but the overall expectation here is that quality education is provided wherever and however its offerings are delivered. So this is where some of our institutions are challenged to be able to demonstrate that the, co the courses offered on the main campus versus the courses offered on a military base are at the same quality of education. And that's important that the institution demonstrate that. So how, are, how is curriculum revised? And in some of our institutions, the military out, outposts actually don't receive as much of the um, updated curriculum as would be expected. And so it may be an area as you work um, within your institutions to really stop and ask. Um, if we're providing education online, <coughs> And that have the same quality aspects of the um, programming that we're offering on ground. Um, what we're offering at our main campus versus what we're offering at alternative facilities, uh, whether it be additional locations or branch campuses throughout the world, um, should be in check uh, by an institution. And so this is one area where institutions wake up and go, wow, we probably do, should do some cross-checking of how we're providing that. It also goes to the point of if an institution has alternative time frames for when courses or programs are offered. Um, some courses may be 16-week courses. Some courses may be 7-week courses. 
And so how are you ensuring that the same quality of education is provided um, within those different types of courses? So once, on a, uh, once again, an opportunity for you to fine tune and identify evidence that would support that high quality. Within this criteria, we also ask for the institution to identify support services that support the different populations of students that they have enrolled. Um, and that may vary from population to population depending on student needs, um, student program expect, um, choices and expectations and things like that. So it's important to really move into this criterion looking specifically at the, at the core components and then we've articulated expectations even more down to that subcomponent level. Um, so I think this is an opportunity here for those of you that are working with veterans um, that you identify those support services and mechanisms to ensure that they are, they are receiving the support that they need um, as they enter your institution and move through your institution. And then also those that are actually in active service that are enrolled at your institution also. Um, so that you can really demonstrate across the board students are treated with consistency um, across the institution. Then criterion four is actually the backside of teaching and learning, really focusing on did the institution meet what it's expected to deliver? Um, and what's the evidence that you have to do that? And how do you know that your, in your programming is is up to speed, that students are learning what you expected them to learn, and that they're completing and fulfilling their expectations as they leave your institution. Um, and so criterion four focuses on uh, a variety of different elements here, one being program review um, and how the institution evaluates its own programming, another focused on assessment of student learning, and the third about persistence, retention, and completion. So there's three big elements in here. Um, no one stands alone. They're all intertwined in many ways in how the institution operates, but this is an opportunity for you to demonstrate that your program review takes into account um, your, your curriculum um, and the different ways that it's delivered. Um, it also calls out actually in that core component how the institution uh, transcripts, uh, tr credits that it transfers in. Um, and other alternative ways that students pr bring their learning and their knowledge into the institution. Um, so let me forward here on this one in core component 4A. Uh, once again, we've got a modification here, but the institution ensures the quality of its educational offerings. Um, and that could be we've moved away from the term program um, and moved to offerings in many, in many places here because we recognize that more and more of our institutions are not offering complete programs, and that's not actually what the student of today is looking for. They may be looking for shorter term credentials um, and different types of, of um, fragmented learning. Um, so we've moved to that term of educational offerings. In this one, we've got some subcomponents here that call this out specifically. Um, subcomponent uh, two under criterion four core component A, 4A, calls for the institution to evaluate all the credit that it transcripts, all the credit it transcripts, including what it awards for experiential learning or other forms of prior learning, or relies on the evaluation of responsible third parties. And so this may be where you're, you're dealing with ACE or some ACE or some of those other opportunities that are out there. Uh, the other core component, subcomponent here is um, 4A3, and that the institution has policies, policies that is, ensure the quality of the credit it accepts in transfer. It has policies that ensure the quality of the credit it accepts in transfer. And this is for some of our institutions, their policies have been relatively weak. Um, the, the, the credit that's accepted in transfer um, can vary quite a bit depending on who's reviewing it at the institution. And so some of our institutions I know have been really working to strengthen um, what they've been working on in terms of um, transfer policies and things like that. And Criterion 5 really focuses on resources, resources not only for the point in time when an institution is evaluated, but the ability for the institution to keep operating um, as an as a institution that provides quality education 
that it's focused its efforts on planning and constantly evaluating how effective it is across all aspects of the institution, not just on assessment of student learning, but facilities and personnel and all of those other different elements that make up the institution as a whole. Um, and so Criterion 5 calls for the institution's resources, structures, processes, and planning um, to be sufficient to fulfill that mission that we talked about earlier and to improve the quality of its educational offerings. Ex with the expectation there that status quo is not good enough, the institution is always striving to improve and what are those improvement efforts and how is the institution out scanning on a regular basis what it's doing, how is it evaluating, how is it um, making plans going forward and, and once those recommendations are made and those plans are made, then where are the resources to support, um, support that activity. And so the redundancy here was the institution plans for the future, we, we made that slight modification. Um, but overall, this, cri this criterion stays pretty much the same. So those are the five criterion. Now, peer reviewers will actually be responsible for reviewing the, the criterion uh, and each of the criteria. And they'll actually evaluate the documents that you provide that affirm um, how you demonstrate compliance. And they look down at that core component level. And so so questions may be, well, what is some possible evidence? We're going to get into that in just a moment here. Um, but, but peer review is concerned with quality improvement. So it's not about necessarily reporting on what you've done for the last four or five years, but what do you intend to do moving forward as an institution? Where are some areas of strength? Uh, where are some er um, um, components, divisions of the institution that are doing things really well that you may want to translate to other? Um, components of the institution, uh, and also what are you working on to improve um, so that you continue or to meet the criterion and the core components or even exceed those in a variety of different ways. So there is a, a, a guidance book on our website. I've got the link here. It's called Providing Evidence. Uh, what we did was we took the criterion and the core components went through team reports, also engaged with peer reviewers to come up with a, a revised document, it's been out about a year now, um, that identifies a wide range of different points of evidence that might be available uh, for an institution to use as evidence to make the case of how um, they're meeting the criteria for accreditation and the core components. So I brought up core component 4A um, as an example. This is the core component that really focuses on program review and the fact that the institution is operating um, at a high level when it's granting credits and awarding credits um, at the institution for its programming. Um, so some of, it, some of those points of evidence may be uh, program review policy, the processes, the schedule, and the guidelines for different types of program review. But you'll see the third bullet here, it's the institution has transfer credit policies, course equivalency guides and credit validation process for prior learning um, and for third party providers. What's been really interesting is that more and more of our institutions are grappling with how to move students through as, um, as quickly as possible. Um, and we've seen quite a few institutions um, trying to award as much credit as possible for anything um, that a student claims is prior learning without a, a good um, structure for evaluating that, which then raises some questions about whether the institution is really beginning to operate more like a diploma mill, whether those students are really prepared and engaged um, and have mastered the knowledge necessary for the degrees being awarded. Um, so that credit validation process is important and it's one of those of heightened interest of our peer reviewers when they're out there at institutions. What we also expect that the institution would have um, policies and procedures on how to accept advanced placement and college level examinations. Um, and it could be a, a homegrown instruments, it could be nationally normed instruments and things like that, but what are the policies and procedures of how that credit would be granted to a student should be in place, should, should be able to provide the policies and um, the process um, guidelines and then also examples of how, um, how that was actually working within the institution and, and what has been awarded and things like that. 
Additional evidence would be in the academic catalog, specifically with information about transfer of credit or experiential learning um, being outlined on what a student needs to go through to be able to um, make that request and the institution follows through then with the analysis that's necessary. Um, and again, uh, data where students uh, go on to after graduation, whether it's employment rates or admission rates or movement into special programs or things like that. Um, and then also articulation agreements with other institutions. What I hear quite often is that um, some, some students will be granted um, credit from one institution for their military experience or their different military courses or things like that. Um, but we haven't gotten to a point yet where all institutions um, will, will accept that and transfer. Um, and so it may be helpful if you have a strong population of students that you're awarding um, credit for in transfer or for military education or things like that, um, and your students are transferring out to another institution, um, this may be an opportunity for you to provide some more um, detailed information about how you went through that process so that next receiving institution has strong confidence that there was an evaluation that took place um, and how things moved forward. I know some of our institutions are actually working on some articulation agreements with um, military credit that's been awarded, so it's clear that it will keep moving forward to that next institution and not be dropped by the, by the what I'll call the receiving institution at this point. Karen, we've got a question. Great. Um, the, the, the question is, should military courses on the JST transcript count as transfer credit or prior slash alternative learning? And the same question for the military occupations credit. Um, I probably here would probably, um, it depends on what where, it's, where that's come from. Transfer credit is typically from one accredited institution to another accredited institution. That's what most um, institutions, how most institutions award it. So it would probably come down to prior or alternative learning. Thank you. You're welcome. I want to touch base a little bit here on our assumed practices. Remember, these sort of run in the background. They're not evaluated on a regular basis except for um, speci very specific incidents that really don't occur very often at our, at our commission um, at the point in time when an institution is um, applying to become accredited and going through the multi-stage process with that. Um, or if an institution is on a sanction and being evaluated at the end of that sanction period, there may be some assumed practices or all the assumed practices that they need to answer to. Um, but typically, like I mentioned, this is really in the background and I think these become guidance points because we assume that all institutions will be um, following these. But they may be helpful for you at your institution if you're going through some changes. So assumed practice, let me go back one slide. Um, assumed practice A is about integrity, um, ethical and responsible conduct. Um, B is about that front end of teaching and learning. C is about that back end of evaluation and improvement. And then D is about resources planning and institutional effectiveness. You're looking at these and saying, well, these are sort of similar to the criteria. They are, but once again, these are what we expect our institutions are, are doing on a, on a regularized basis, and this is a um, how uh, basic functioning levels of our institutions would be operating at. So on the ethical piece, um, operating with integrity, here is where the institution makes readily available to students and the general public clear and complete information, including policies and accept acceptance of transfer credits, other credits applied to degree requirements. Um, but here, except for courses articulated, um, the institution makes no promises to its prospective students regarding the acceptance of credit awarded by examination, credit for prior learning, or credit of transfer until an evaluation has been conducted. Um, for some of our institutions, we've had to remind them of this assumed practice. Um, quite often, the enrollment uh, management or admissions teams and things like that, anxious to bring students in, uh, will give a verbal of what they think the students will be awarded in um, credit. So a student ends up enrolling in that institution thinking that X number of credits are going to um, be uh, uh, transferred in or acknowledged or things like that, only to find out several weeks or a month later or things like that when an evaluation is done, it's really far off from where they expected 
um, they would be in, in terms of working towards completion of a credential. So it's important that you um, work with folks around the institution not having folks to make um, verbal um, assurances or commitments until that evaluation has actually been conducted. Um, and that's been a challenge for some of our institutions um, to really hold true to this. Um, but once we've pointed this out, they said, okay, this is helpful because now I can take this to other different committees and, and groups within the institution. <clears throat> but this is where the first part of this um, slide says, the institution makes readily available clear and complete information. Um, and it should be at a point where if a student inquires what the process is, the student should be able to understand what the process for that evaluation would be. And we do have some of our institutions we're working with on, on this issue because they tend to um, keep it pretty back house, not very transparent. Students aren't sure um, what, what, how it's going to be evaluated, how soon they'll know about that evaluation, what's, what will be granted in credit, and what will be applied towards the degree that they are trying or credential they are trying to earn. It's one thing to grant credit. It's another thing to apply towards the credential. Um, and so institutions need to work on clarification with that a little bit more also. Um, over in uh, assumed practice B, where we're talking about sort of that front end of expectations there, um, we've, we're talking here, the institution main structures or practices that ensure the coherence and quality for program, of the programs for which it awards a degree. Typically, institutions will require that at a minimum 30 or 25 percent of the 120 credits earned for the bachelor's degree and 15, once again 25 percent of the credits for the associate's degree be credits earned at the institution itself through arrangements with other um, accredited institutions or through contractual arrangements approved, uh, relationships approved by the commission. So once again, we've got here active learning taking place for at least 25 percent of that degree. Um, and there has been some questions about this over the years. Um, Karen, we've got a couple. I'm sorry, we've got a couple questions. Okay. Uh, I think related to this slide. The first one is just for clarification: Would transfer credit equivalency tables that are posted on the institution's website be exempt from A.5? Actually, those equivalency tables would be clear and complete information that would be encouraged um, by our institutions. Great, great. And then we have a comment uh, saying that transparency on that point is important. Absolutely. And yes. And another one, once an evaluation of the JST is made, then there is a possibility of direct credit for a course, if I understand this correctly. It could be, yes. Okay. And the last one we've got currently is by accreditation, are you suggesting regional or does this include national as well? What's interesting about this, um, our president here at the commission is one of the lead negotiators uh, at negotiated rulemaking uh, for the U.S. Department of Education. She was at that session uh, this week, though one of the days was snowed out in Washington, D.C., uh, but several of us in our office have been watching the streaming activity, which is really exciting activity. <laughs> Um, but they actually got into a big discussion about this, and right now the Department of Education is proposing that we're, um, all agencies, whether regional or national, be, be termed as a nationally recognized accrediting agency. Not a regional accrediting agency or a national accrediting agency, but nationally recognized. Um, trying to um, pull away from that wall that in, in some cases has been falsely um, put into place that limits students' opportunities to move credits earned from nationally accredited um, uh, institutions that are nationally accredited into regionally accredited institutions. That's not our policy anywhere. That tends to be institutional policy. In some cases, it may be state regulation, um, and we've actually seen some very narrow regulation in a few states that requires it from institutions only within the region and doesn't acknowledge institutions outside of the region. Um, so it is not HLC um, policy that we limit, but you may have other factors that are limiting your institution's ability to accept um, credit from nationally accredited institutions. Once again, it's how you evaluate that credit and make that determination. But I would say 
from my experience, the majority of institutions have quite a bit of language around transfer of credit that really leans towards regionally accredited institutions. I think going forward, the, um, the emphasis on uh, credentialing and students not having to retake courses over and over again for knowledge that they can demonstrate, um, and that's an important factor. Um, I think some of our institutions are taking uh, a step to make sure that these students have the knowledge um, coming from other institutions. Um, and in some different ways that may be appearing, becoming um, more of a practice than maybe in the past of, the, of just accepting the credit. Sarah, do we have more questions? Uh, no, I think, oh, let's see here, we do. Um, question is, we are developing a bridge program for military trained dental assistants. We have a crosswalk, all military curriculum plans with course objectives in our program and pending CODA approval. We are proposing an 18.5 credit award with an articulation agreement. If this is approved, what do we need to do to ask for HLC approval? The students must take a comprehensive exam by us prior to the credit being awarded. Um. Actually, this sounds exactly what we would, be, we would be looking for. You have identified a way to evaluate the student knowledge. Um, we have many institutions that are moving into a portfolio um, arrangements where students can bring in that different type of knowledge um, and post it in different ways uh, by building their portfolio or going through an examination process, um, which sounds like you're, you're doing so that you can actually verify the knowledge. Um, prior to bringing those students in and awarding them credit and allowing them to continue on a curriculum. I think that's, um, you know, personally, uh, this is not a stance written by the commission, but personally, I think that sets the students up well to understand if they're going to succeed in the program or if they need some additional um, um, knowledge building before they actually enter the program. So my question actually would be back to the person that asked that is what will you do if a student takes that examination um, and doesn't pass that examination? Does that mean they're barred from entering the institution? Do they go back to their previous place? Or do you, will you have some, it, will you through those examinations identify potentially that there's, there's a gap with a, a group of students in um, one element of, of science um, and maybe a module that the institution may choose to create? Um, and give that as a, a sort of a uh, expectation piece, sort of a remedial piece, developmental piece that institutions must demonstrate completion of that um, and then come in on a provisional basis or something like that. It's something to think about as you move forward. Right, and it sounds like they've got a remediation plan uh, in place to re-examine them. And uh, they will have a 60-hour review course prior to taking the exam too. Uh, a lot of my work right now here in the office, uh, we've got a, a big initiative funded by Lumina Foundation uh, who's been g very generous to support um, so many new initiatives in higher education, which we're really appreciative of. Um, but part of that initiative that we're working on is really focused on student success. And um, we've got a paper that just came out, came out in December. We've got another one coming out in a week. Uh, but the one that came out in, in um, a proposal, a thought paper that came out, was really to shift the conversation to not to look about uh, as much um, to institutional success, but student success with an emphasis on student intent. Um, and I think that's going to start to shift. If we move that way and we, we start shifting and adopting policies and processes and expectations for institutions, I think um, it, part of the language that's being proposed is not just student intent, but student progression not just persistence and retention. You can persist for a long time. You can be retained by an institution, but you get no closer towards your credential. Um, so some of the language being proposed by this, um, this group is actually that we shift to student intent and student progression. Um, and I think in this example that we're talking about, now that would be a, a, a really strong way to provide evidence that here was the student intent um, and here's where we identified where they were going to be challenged, making it to the credential. Um, and so here's what we put in place to assist with student progression. Um, and I think that would be a, a, a strong example as you, as you think about Criterion 3 and Criterion 4. Should we move on, Sarah? Yeah, I think so. We're doing okay. great. Thank you. 
Sure. Um, here, uh, in another um, element under the assumed practices, um, the institution has a clear policy on the maximum allowable credit for prior learning as a reasonable proportion of the credits required to complete the program, um, that the credit is documented, evaluated, and appropriate for the level of degree awarded. Um, this is not talking about transfer credit. This is talking about prior learning, and so there's a distinction there. Um, but a clear policy on the maximum allowable credit for prior learning. I'm going to take you back a couple slides here, and I want to remind you, of, or just one slide, I want to remind you here that typically institutions will, be, will require that at a minimum 30 of 120 credits for bachelors, 15 of 60 credits is actually taught and the student is in active learning mode with the institution. If we go back to this prior learning, technically, though not actually um, um, advocated, technically students could, based on commission, um, assumed practices, not on institutional policies, um, an, an institution could grant up to 75% of prior learning credit and then some other active learning take place there. We don't have a limitation. There's been some folklore out there that we only allow 10% or 25%. Our policies do not limit in that way. It's really pushed out to institutional policy. With the expectation, though, at the end of the program, the student should be able to demonstrate that it has learned and understands um, the outcomes that were expected for that academic program. Um, there's always been a concern that this amount of flexibility will lead some institutions to, to be diploma mills, but our expectation is that students can demonstrate their learning and then the learning is appropriate for the credential being awarded. So. Just wanted to clarify that because I know there have been some questions about that over time. Let's look at a couple different cases here. Sarah, and you can jump in any time to help out here with this one. Um, this is a case example where a, an institution allows a maximum of 60 credits that may be applied to a bachelor's degree. So if the bachelor's degree is at the um, minimum level of 120 credits, this, in, in this case an institution would allow 50% um, of an array of different credits to be applied towards the degree. Um, and it could be the ACE um, credit recommendations. Um, in this situation, the institution limits that to 30 credits. Um, and like we said, like we've got two examples that are going to come up here. In this one, these are institutional case examples. These are not HLC um, policy, and I want to make that very, very clear here. Um, also allows for portfolio review, and students may also take a range of um, national tests. Uh, it could be also internal tests as far as that goes. So um, we don't limit that, but here the institution provides an array of options for students to consider how they could gain credit um, towards that credential that they're looking for, in this case being the bachelor's degree. What's interesting though, um, if you look in the far right-hand column there, um, this institution does not count these credits that are, um, come through in this way towards the residency requirement. So the student um, is, is once again expected to take several courses within the institution or one of the institution's partners or things like that, depending on what the residency rules are. Um, so that and means... And Karen, we've got... I'm sorry. Okay. Um, We've got a, a question. Uh, so does HLC consider military credit, prior learning, or transfer credit? For example, is CCAF transfer credit since it's accredited? CCAF is community college? The college, the Air Force. So it's an accredited institution. To, uh, uh, credits coming from an accredited institution count as transfer credits because you're transferring from one institution to another. Prior learning is what you see up here on the board, um, or up on the screen here. Other ways that students can demonstrate learning that hasn't been acknowledged by another accredited institution. So it's the ACDE recommendations, um, content expert um, faculty case-by-case -case review. Could be a portfolio review, and that could even be done by an external um, partner that you have but a standardized process to recognize um, work within portfolios, or it could be a range of uh, some of the different tests that are posted there. 
So you've got two different um, elements there. If it's coming from another uh, institutional accreditor, um, like I mentioned before, it doesn't have to be a regional accreditor. That's not our policy, but I would suspect the majority of your institutions in your transfer language, policy language, probably list regionally accredited institution. That's not our, that's not our expectation. Um, we did not put that limitation down. Knowing that some, um, some institutions that are with national accrediting agencies are there because of the nature of the type of institution that they are, um, or it may be historical piece. Um, I had one institution, an art school, uh, that finally became a member with our agency, but for years was with a national accrediting agency because they were a small family-owned for-profit um, art school. And um, when they first began several decades ago, that was really the only way you could become accredited was to start through the um, national art accreditor and then go to the, one of the national accrediting agencies um, and move that way. For them to make the shift to our agency, um, there was a lot more general education uh, expectation required than what they typically been offering, and so they had to make that shift in curriculum. They decided that was a institutional goal was to become uh, regionally accredited at that point in time. But you've got flexibility there. Let me look at the one other case here. In this case, the institution allows for only 40 credits to be um, applied to our bachelor's degree instead of up to 60. Um, and then 20 credits towards an associate's degree. And it, it doesn't put any limitations on any one of these types of formats that are allowed where the previous case put limits on how many credits could come in through um, portfolio and how many credits could come in through. So there were caps put on there. This one allows a little bit more flexibility um, as far as that goes. So you could have somebody bringing in 40 credits from um, the ACE recommendations where the previous slide only allowed for, I think, 30 um, credits. So it's really up to the institution to make this determination, but it should be, as we've talked about before, um, transparent, clearly articulated, um, and, and the institution should be able to demonstrate with evidence those evaluations that have taken place so that as peer reviewers come through, uh, going back to one of the first slides, the institution can assure the quality um, of the programming that it's offering and the credentials that are being awarded. Um, and it, that's really where the institution needs to make the case for that and present that to the peer reviewers instead of the peer reviewers trying to guess and figure it out. Also, for students to know very clearly how they can move into the institution, um, gain advantage of as much previous learning that they've had, both at institutions and what they've learned on their own or with other entities and, and things like that. Sarah, I don't have any more slides at this point in time. Are there any more questions? Yes, does anybody have any additional questions for Karen? We've got one. They said, hang on, let them type. So it's okay. going to come through in a minute. <laughs> well, I think what I'm hoping what, what came through today was the fact that um, the commission ha allows the institutions to make a lot of the decisions about how they um, will acknowledge and accept um, and re award credit uh, for military experience in a variety of different ways. Um, but I do want to just highlight once again, uh, we've got several military institutions that are accredited. Those credits coming through would come through and transfer just like any other institution. Um, but really when we're talking about those other credits that need to be evaluated, they're coming from um, military courses taken um, as part of training or um, field experience or things like that um, that allows the institution the flexibility to determine how it's going to grant those credits. Great. Uh, one question came through. Do we notify HLC with our dental assisting bridge program or do we need approval? Um, let me go back here. So this is, um, you're going to transfer, from what I understand from the previous, your previous question, um, this is an articulation that you have identified. Um, your students are going to take an entrance examination um, before, I wouldn't call it necessarily, must take a, um, the original question was, students must take a comprehensive examination um, by us prior to the credit being awarded. Um, I think here it may be an, um, sort of more of an entrance examination or, or things like that. 
um, comprehensive may trigger some different expectations um, when peer reviewers see that terminology in some ways. Um, So I'm not sure here in this in this question if the institution is actually providing any educational opportunity here or just articulating credits in and then giving an exam. If that's the case, it doesn't meet that 25% threshold. So we may need um, a little bit of more clarification on that one. Okay. Uh, next question is, could you discuss a bit more about how a school would ensure the quality of credit accepted in transfer that was granted by PLA. Sure, there's a lot of literature out there about prior learning, and we have some institutions, that, especially institutions that have been involved with adult students for many, many years. Um, you will find some interesting rubrics out there in the literature and different policies and processes and things like that. Um, some of them are actually asking students to demonstrate through portfolio. Um, it may be that they're actually providing examples of work-related experience. Um, I can demonstrate they don't need to sit in a classroom and learn that anymore. Um, some of our institutions, when they're thinking about um, um, that, that prior learning, um, they may actually give the departmental or the course exam, a final exam, to see where the students um, test on that, uh, those elements and things like that. So. There are so many different mechanisms that our institutions are working at to try and recognize that everybody's not coming into the institution at, ground, um, at the ground floor, that many have um, built a knowledge base that's um, demonstrable collegiate level work in a variety of different ways. So I encourage you to, to review the literature that's out there and identify several different models and then vet those models within your institution. Great, thank you. And the last question of the session, with many states having legislation to award military credit, JST and the CCAF, I think they are considering all of this credit transfer credit, but should these states have separate policies, perhaps one for CCAF to be transfer credit and one for JST to be prior learning assessment? Yeah, I, I do. We outline that within our criteria and our core components. We call out transfer policies and then prior learning or experiential learning um, policies, um, and they are not one and the same. Um, in many cases, they need to be evaluated differently, um, and it also depends on how they're recognized on your and how they're transcripted on your transcript. I think that's an important element that we didn't discuss today: is that how you actually transcript that that knowledge. Um, and award credit for it so that that transcript, um, while foreign to some people, still is a, is a document that has value to the student. And so um, it may also be that there's an accompanying document or a stamp on the transcript that explains this is prior learning credit awarded through evaluation or things like that. Um, so it's very clear on the transcript what um, credits came in from knowledge gained someplace else and what credits were actually awarded by the institution for um, uh, through registering for courses and demonstrating that knowledge um, through specific courses. Great. Thank you so much. You're um, welcome. We do, we do have our past MCMC webinars located uh, on the website here. This one will be posted uh, a little bit later today. And you can always join the conversation on our Facebook page. And I'm going to plug our next webinar, which is February the 12th, and it's Bubbling Issues Regarding Military Connected Students, and we will have a representative from SVA, Student Veterans of America, to provide us with some information. Again, my name is Sarah Appel, Program Manager, Multi-State Collaborative on Military Credit, and my contact information is below. Thank you all so much for joining us today, and thank you again, Karen, uh, for supplying this really, really important information to our colleagues. Well, Sarah, thank you for the invitation. And what I really appreciate were the questions um, so that folks uh, on this webinar could uh, go back to their offices and their colleagues and just work on improving um, their efforts. Thank you so much. Great. You're welcome. And speaking of good questions, uh, Karen has um, asked that we add two additional questions to our usual survey that comes out right after the end of this webinar. So please make sure you take a look at those and um, 
again, provide us some feedback or some additional questions we can pass along. Again, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful Thursday, and we will see you at the next webinar.